Is that okay? I'll go ahead and yeah, 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 no problem. And I'll just unmute it. Okay. Thank you. So let's, let's give a few minutes because I think we probably have to leave. Yeah. And we need to actually sign up. Where's the staff? We we probably need to have a phone book. Yeah, the here's I got the room for. All right, so we'll, we'll get started. I think it is time. So we gave the uh, folks the five academic minutes to be late, and this is a good time to start. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Michael Valdea. I'm, I'm here representing the Energy Institute uh, at UT Austin, and it is my pleasure to introduce uh, Mr. John Berger, uh, who is going to be our, our speaker today. Uh, he is the Chief Executive Officer of Sonova Energy International, which he founded in 2012 and his, has since served as the CEO, President, and Chairman of the Board. But he does have, beyond that, more than two decades of experience in the power industry. And he is actually a serial entrepreneur. So before Sonova, he was the founder and CEO of Suncap Financial, which was a a uh, residential solar service provider, and also a founder of Standard Renewable Energy, a uh, provider and installer of um, energy efficient product services and, and renewable energy. Um, he is, uh, has always supported the free market competition and is a proponent of consumer choice, advancement of energy technology to power independence. Uh, he holds a MBA from the Harvard Business School and he graduated cum laude uh, from Texas A&M with a bachelor's in civil engineering. Of course, we're not going to hold that against him. Uh, so the, the, the subject today um, is incredibly exciting. So um, Mr. Berger is a proponent of accelerating the energy transition, and his vision is that the US should become energy independent and self-reliant 
um, with a transition that is all about balance. It's about uh, power in, in a distributed way. Uh, the power business is moving towards a more distributed, decentralized model um, to improve reliability. And we know here in Austin what reliability means. If anybody's been around um, last year, let's say around February, uh, would completely understand the goals that uh, Mr. Berger set, has set forth. So without further ado, I think we owe a round of applause to our speaker. And John, please, we look forward to hearing from you. Thank you for being here. Thank you. All right. This, yeah, it works. Okay. All right. Well, uh, welcome, and thanks for having me here. Uh, a little bit, just to get started, just talk about the, the firm itself and how we got started uh, and, and what is, you know, what is uh, Sonova. Uh, we got started, uh, as uh, he mentioned, Back in 2012, uh, really uh, had about now 26 years in the power business and uh, started trading power uh, as I graduated from A&M and uh, actually ran a utility system, right? Five weeks after I graduated from Texas A&M uh, uh, during the Olympic Games in Georgia. Um, so was that a great idea? Probably not, but it was a great experience. And really had a lot of physical power experience uh, to draw upon from the years. I also spent some years at the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission in Washington. Uh, in particular, uh, it was my in-between years at, at Harvard. And so that was uh, uh, 2002 was uh, um, a rather infamous time in the US power industry where you had a lot of independent power producers that were basically including one week and we're all gonna file for bankruptcy at the same time. So this was the uh, downfall uh, and the fallout for Enron's collapse and then caused a number of other companies to uh, collapse in bankruptcy either at that point in time or, or later down the road. So a lot of turmoil uh, in the power business, but unfortunately not a lot of innovation. And so I kept looking for that and I had a feeling that the, uh, the energy business, uh, global energy business was gonna change. And, and when I got out of Harvard, started doing some venture capital investing and then founded the, my uh, uh, first firm. Basically, I, I wanted to stop torturing the entrepreneurs and just go join them. Uh, and so what I did was I founded a solar contractor, which is Standard Renewable. So it gives me a lot of experience. Uh, I grew up in the construction business. I got a civil engineering degree uh, and so know a lot about construction. And I said, hey, I'm just going to go out there and try uh, to put, I don't know, uh, energy efficiency was a big part of what high efficiency air conditioning is doing energy audits and then uh, doing uh, this uh, solar installation. And I even did some wind turbines on the homes and so forth. And you know, I sold that business later on, and, you know, navigated through the financial crisis and sold it in 2011. And what I realized coming out of that was that solar was gonna be the big winner. Uh, that was my belief, uh, that the cost structure was gonna come down far faster than, than frankly most, if not anybody thought. Uh, it happened faster than I thought it would. And that, you know, most likely there was going to be, uh, you know, a, a need for storage technologies as well to provide that kind of level of reliability in an intermittent uh, resource like solar. And so knew that batteries were going to have to come at some point in time, uh, possibly fuel cells and so forth, some generators, some clean generators. But that it, essentially that the centralized power system was going to be reformed, uh, uh, not eliminated, but essentially look uh, in terms of the new power industry, and this is our view today, uh, more, more like the internet, where you would have a combination, instead of 100% centralized, it would be some portion centralized and some portion decentralized, okay? And so the intelligence, the capabilities would be pushed to the endpoints of the system, we call those homes, businesses, and so forth, and we would have a lot stronger, uh, more reliable, more economic system to really move us into the digital age. You know, it's interesting when you go look at the energy business, I don't care if it's uh, uh, producing hydrocarbons and there's some very, uh, you know, uh, high-end technologies for deep sea uh, drilling and so forth. But a lot of what we do uh, when you look at internal combustion engines and so forth is really literally developed in the industrial revolution. And so this is one of the, if not the last industry in terms of the energy business, it really needs to be reformed and moved into the, into the digital age. And so as we move forward in time, 
uh, my feeling was is that uh, you would need to have a service provider, or as a, what a utility does today, uh, to essentially bring in all these technologies that these hardware companies would produce, mix that with some software, and essentially make the power run, make the power flow. And that's what Sonova is. Sonova is a wireless power company. We're basically taking in all the technologies from Tesla, Generac, Enphase, SolarEdge, and many others, including some companies that probably don't exist today. Maybe one of you or several of you will found the new companies out there on the hardware side and incorporating those into solutions that we finance and we service. So it's our men and women that are in the trucks that are going around every single hour, almost of every single day, uh, fixing the systems when they, things go wrong. And things do go wrong even with solar systems. And so uh, from there, uh, we can also provide aggregation capabilities. So we can aggregate all these different homes up and soon to be businesses, put them together, and then provide resource capability to utilities or regional transmission organizations like ERCOT. Everybody know what ERCOT is? I think everybody in the country knows what ERCOT is after last February, right? <laughs> Not necessarily for the right reason. So we can provide that just as a utility provides aggregation services to the rest of its customers as well. Now, again, it's important how do you integrate these two systems, behind the meter, front of the meter, decentralized, centralized, however you want to phrase it, how do you integrate those uh, together is the big debate. And there's a lot of debates that are going on. Uh, there is a, a, you know, a big, strong impetus and push by the current administration uh, to do something about climate change. But then there's also a mix up and a dust up over national security. Where do the panels, solar panels come from? Where do the batteries come from? Where is the oil and gas coming from? Where is the coal coming from, right? And uh, when you look at uh, the uh, desire by the current administration to make some things happen, you'd find a couple of things. One, unfortunately, not much progress, and there's a lot of trade war issues and so forth that's gone on uh, in that. And, and, and in terms of the federal government's ability to make influence, it's really not there. It's on the state side of things. And so various states have different policies. Various states are moving in different directions uh, with regards to policy. And the, another part of that is, how do you have, as a state regulator, a system that fairly compensates the decentralized or the behind the meter and still keeps the front of the meter and centralized systems running and providing the power and reliability that we've all uh, known them to provide over the last 130 years or so? Those are big debates. You see those. So one of those was settled last uh, week in Florida where Governor DeSantis vetoed legislation that would have severely limited uh, consumer choice in Florida. Uh, and uh, then you've got the big debate that's going on still in California. So it'll be interesting to see what happens um, out there. Those are just two debates, but there's also a lot. There's some in Texas uh, that are happening, some, most of that behind the scenes that are occurring. So we're heavily involved in the regulatory side of things. And a lot of what happens in the businesses, as you look across the industry, is going to be heavily dependent upon what happens on the regulatory front, whether it's at the federal level or at the, uh, at the state level, at least for the United States. Uh, Europe is a, is a different story uh, and uh, you know, can be much more on the EU level, but more driven by the country policy, okay, rather than even within the different states within the country. So there's a, you, you take an a, a, a industry that's very complex, very much uh, in, in, uh, in terms of involvement by government, high involvement by government. And that makes it where this is a fairly complex business to run. That's why I have some gray hairs. Uh, it's not just being the entrepreneur. Uh, this is not for the faint of heart, but at the same time, there's a lot of opportunity here. Again, you're talking about an industry that has not been changed by the digital revolution, like telecommunications has, like so many other businesses have. I mean, frankly, even medicine's more advanced than energy um, on things. It used to be that the uh, medical field was the one that dr uh, drugged the most, if you will. And so there's a lot of things and opportunities that are out there. Uh, and what we do is we go out as a company, we try to find all the different uh, technology pieces. We develop a lot of software. We get a lot of software partnerships, integrate those software pieces in. And we focus on serving the customer and then aggregating those customers up 
and seeing what we can do or what we're allowed to do by the regulator to provide more reliability for the system and society as a whole. So that's what Sonova is. So again, think of us as a wireless power company. We um, have a very uh, large amount of cash flows that are contracted, just like a utility uh, would have, and we have a, a fairly large balance sheet. We're founded in Houston, uh, so we were the largest renewable energy firm in Texas, uh, right up until a small one decided to move from California here to Austin, uh, Tesla, right? Uh, we, we do a lot of business with Tesla. In fact, nobody does more business with them uh, on the Powerwall side, the stationary battery, and the world uh, than Sonova. So there's a, lot, there's a strong relationship there. Uh, and uh, you know, we personally, as a company, uh, believe that what uh, we are currently seeing right now is the beginnings of an energy triangle. Uh, Houston, Austin, College Station. I'm from Bryan College Station, so I'm gonna just put the College Station in there. Uh, and really looking for a lot of bright minds. You've got the two, I think, uh, preeminent universities in the country, certainly some of the largest, right, uh, in, in A&M and, and UT. Uh, you also have great uh, uh, universities in Rice and U of H in, in Houston. And then you've got a lot of energy companies, very large energy companies. You've got Tesla down here, um, Sonova. We're a little bit smaller than Tesla, but who isn't, uh, in, in Houston. And then you've got all the big oil and gas companies. You've got the big oil service companies. You've got a lot of, of capabilities of logistics uh, in the port of Houston with the rail lines. There's just a lot happening here. And by the way, this is a very low cost area uh, to do business. And it's a rapidly growing population. If you look at the youth of the population, the diversity of the population, the most diverse city in the United States, who wants to guess what it is? Houston. So a lot of folks would guess LA, New York, I would have too, but years ago, but it's actually Houston, Texas. Uh, and so we use that to our benefit. And I think that's part, of, I'm looking out the audience here, that clearly exists here at the University of Texas as well. And I think all that gives very much an attribute to this region to grow up and lead uh, the new energy business and to transition energy. Some may call it energy addition, uh, some may call it, uh, you know, a, a, a you know, complete renewable energy takeover. We prefer to look at it as a transition over a period of time that may or may not ever see the end of fossil fuel usage in its entirety uh, before I leave this, this earth, whenever that may be. But I think at the, the point here is, is that we need to work together down the middle of the road, whether it's fossil fuels and renewable energy, or whether it's the current highly regulated centralized power and the currently highly unregulated decentralized power and try to figure out how to make all this work and really advance uh, the, the energy business globally, not just in the, in the United States. And uh, I think uh, it, it's uh, really become uh, a necessity to do this. Uh, when you look at uh, what's right to do for the world, why one of the reasons I did it is one, I, I felt like consumer uh, uh, tastes were changing. Uh, and what I mean by this is, is that people wanted cleaner, more reliable power. The pandemic accelerated this, by the way. Why? Because more people, including those that uh, uh, work and make up Sonova, work from their home. And so they're looking for more reliable power. Businesses are expected to stay open and simply closing it because a hurricane came or something is becoming increasingly not okay to do uh, from a consumer standpoint. So the consumer, the market is changed and is changing in that direction very rapidly. Cleaner, more affordable, more reliable energy. Uh, the other is climate change. We need to do something about climate change. You've heard a lot about that and increasingly so, and I'm, I'd, I'd hazard to bet that every person here views this as the existential threat to mankind and we need to do something about it, not just sit there and talk about it. I had the uh, opportunity to meet um, uh, uh, Secretary Kerry when he was in Sarah Week, and he spent a lot of time asking, talking about the big uh, oil companies and so forth, what can you do, what can you do this and that, and, and that's great, and he should be doing that. There's nothing wrong with that, absolutely should happen. Um, but what I uh, reminded him is, it's gonna be the startups, if you look at across history, uh, the startups in every industry are really the ones, the entrepreneurs, that go out there and make a, ch and make a change and make a difference. 
And I think that that will be the case with the energy business as well. Doesn't mean that the old line companies, so to speak, that have been around 100 plus years don't have a role, won't have success. I hope they do, obviously, and we need them. But you really got to look forward to the companies, that, the names you've never heard of before, that they're really going to lead uh, the change. And that's climate change. The last one is, unfortunately, we got reminded of, which most people forgot, which is national security. And with Russia's invasion and aggression in Ukraine, uh, we've now been all painfully made aware that the national security has a of utmost importance into the global energy business. And then obviously Europe is scrambling to unravel what they put together over decades within a matter of weeks, months, uh, because they don't have a choice. Um, we must stop the aggression. But unfortunately, uh, there's a lot of countries out there who have zero respect for human rights and zero respect for democracy. And they're very important in the hydrocarbon business. And we need to be prepared for those countries to maybe not to do things, and some of them already are, that we no longer feel uh, that we can support financially by buying energy sources from them as well. So those three reasons, consumer demands of changing, climate change, and national security importance and changes that uh, are required there are really what's driving and going to drive this industry. And I would say this, that sitting in your shoes, which I can tell you, uh, Everybody uh, that's, that's my age and above would love to be sitting in your shoes and, and be able, all those years back. Uh, but uh, you have an enormous amount of opportunity ahead of you. Uh, wherever you want to go, whatever part of the industry, and I spend a lot of time over the years talking to, to folks, not just uh, uh, young folks like yourself, but also older folks that want to make a change and say, well, what should I do? I want to come in and do something. And it's more just starting and saying, here's where the value chain is. Here's where my view of what's happening. Here's where the focus is. You know, so some, if you want to go off into wind and so forth, there's a lot of activity obviously going on wind. Uh, some want to focus on hydrogen, maybe some up to, uh, you know, uh, uh, massive you know, hydrogen creation, uh, you know, with uh, whether it's blue, gray, and, and green hydrogen and so forth. Uh, and then there's some that do uh, biogas, biomass, uh, and, and those are places where you can go and really have some impact of being a part of those companies, developing those technologies and so forth. But some of those are rather limited in nature by definition. And so my, my advice is find something like solar storage, maybe it's hydrogen, that has a lot of different uh, potential to be very big. And then figure out where you want to go based on what you want to do with your life. You want to Go in finance. You want to do finance. Okay, well, here's the different areas and part of the value chain. Companies like mine, you should go uh, take a hard look at that. We do a lot of financing. Um, if you want to focus more on hardware development, probably not at Sonova, but certainly hardware analysis, taking a look at the different pieces of, of equipment, some of which I think is being done with you all here, and saying what new technologies make sense to do and how do we integrate those into our software platform, make them work for consumers? Software development, we're one of the largest software development firms in the renewable energy or energy transition, whatever you wanna call it, industry. So we definitely are hiring for, for those roles as well. And, and then you look at marketing. We do a lot of marketing. We're gonna do a lot of communications. Head of communications is actually back there. So we do a lot of things on the marketing communications front that if that's what you want to do with your life, you should, you should take a look at a firm like us. Maybe somebody making solar panels, for instance. Some opportunities there, but not as much, right? And then you're looking at uh, you know, being a project manager. You can work in project manager for a number of our dealers, um, but that's also a role that we do. And we look at microgrids, for instance, uh, possibly commercial. We're looking at getting involved in that. Um, so there's a lot of opportunity to run projects for us, but probably not as much uh, for a role like that in, say, an equipment manufacturer. So there's a number of things that you can do. Just focus on where you want to go, at what part of the energy business, and I call it the energy business, not the renewable energy business per se, but the broader energy business, 
inclusive of oil and gas and coal and centralized power and everything else, and then figure out what you want to do skill set wise, and then go to the different companies that happen to be in those different parts of the value chain. Uh, the other thing, uh, part, the other path is uh, my path, entrepreneurship. Now, um, you know, I did work for other companies beforehand doing entrepreneurship. Uh, it's really more about, you know, you want that kind of experience versus, you know, really looking at, uh, hey, here's the opportunity, I need to go for it. And I certainly understand that. And you may or may be too early, maybe right on time, who knows. Um, but over, however you get here, what I would say is, is that, you know, fo find something, focus in on it, make sure that you can network enough that you're not trying to build an empire in one firm. Like, really focus. You want to have something that's a, a better part of a battery or a different control technology. Focus on that and figure out how you partner up with different firms to get them that technology, that piece of hardware to market, like Sonova or somebody else. But try not to try to do everything at one time. I've seen that to be over and over. Personally, I tried it with the first firm. It doesn't really work, I can tell you that. Um, and then you got to raise a lot of capital. That's the other thing is um, I don't care what you've decided to do um, in the energy business. It's big money. It's big money in oil and gas. It's big money in solar. It's big money in wind. It's a lot of money, billions and billions of dollars typically. Even in software, you're talking at least tens of millions, if not hundreds of millions of dollars. I think we've invested in software would be well past $100 million uh, and growing rapidly, exponentially at this point in time, to give you an idea. So there's a lot of money involved. Figure out how, if you can't figure out how to raise money, go find a partner and, and hire that him or her, and you go out there and raise money, and then don't run out of the money. That doesn't work, I, I can tell you that. There's been plenty of that in this, in this space. But that's another part of the career path is to do the entrepreneur side of things as well. Uh, and maybe a, place, a good place to start is working at a company like Sonova uh, where you can gain some experiences, gain some relationships, maybe come up with some ideas, and then who knows? I, I certainly wouldn't fault you going out there and trying to do your own. Just don't compete with me, but just work with me. That's all I ask, but no, I'm just kidding. But there's a lot of opportunities out there. So, you know, I've told you what Sonova is, told you about, you know, why uh, I've gotten into it, what's going on with the industry. Um, and I've told you what I thought uh, the past of, of careers and, and opportunities are within the broader industry, and then uh, maybe even doing something on your own. So uh, I think with, uh, with that, I'm sure I left off a few things I was supposed to say, but I think with that, I'll probably just uh, stop and, and see if there's any questions that I can answer. Thank you. Um, thank you, John, for the energizing talk. And we have plenty of time for questions, so please raise your hands and uh, we'll walk over with the mic. Anybody want to go first? <laughs> you can go second. I know, I answered a lot so, of y'all's questions before. Well, let, let me ask you a question first. So, so you made very good points about how much money goes on the entrepreneur side into the energy business. Um, what, what does the picture look like from the consumer side? So, so how do we make this transition fair, right? The cost of having an electrician put in a panel is about $1,000, and I know that from my own experience. Yeah. And, and that was on the low side. Um, so installing an entire system, hardware plus installation, labor, and so on, um, is, is quite expensive. How can we get it to, to the point where it's accessible to most of us without subsidies? And, and I know you, you made the argument to Congress that we should see subsidies in 2015, 2016. So how, how do we make it such that people have access to, to this latest technology and into the future? Yeah, so in terms of access uh, to the technologies, there, there is a, a very broad set of the population in this country that, that has that access capability now, uh, mainly through uh, firms and, and, a, and a small handful of our, my competitors. We provide the financing. So you don't cough up any money, zero money, up front. And then you just pay by the month like you do in the utility side of things. Uh, the area, and there was a question we were at, you know, at the lunch, 
we were talking about, yeah, but what about those folks that have bad credit? And, and, and again, I stress that it's not necessarily they have low income, although 40% of our customers are low moderate income. Uh, it is that they have had struggles in life, they can't pay their bills and haven't in some cases, personal bankruptcies, et cetera. And uh, you know, that's not zero portion of the population, it's not 50%, but it's a, it's a decent chunk, right? So in the centralized power business, we, we have that, uh, those losses, that, that power that's sold to somebody that doesn't pay for it, socialized. So we all pay it. So there is a, um, an idea, a series of programs at the federal and some of the state levels to essentially put credit backstops in there so that firms like us would extend credit to folks that we wouldn't normally extend credit to. When I say we, it'd be we, the securitization market, insurance companies, pension funds, asset managers, and banks. They tell us this is what we're willing to do and accept. We have a vote in that as well, but uh, let's put it this way. If we vote yes and they vote no, it's no. <laughs> that's, the way, that's the way the world works. And so there are ways, I think, eventually, very clearly, that if we had cre the same credit wrap that the utilities have on our side, that we could expand that to the entire credit spectrum. So that's, that's that piece of it. I will, uh, I'd be amiss if, if I didn't bring up that Sonova has done a very, I think, important job of extending the ability to have solar and this financing of solar and storage and so forth to all parts of the country. And in particular, uh, we, we actually opened up Puerto Rico. This is prior to Maria. Uh, and we opened Guam, Saipan. Anybody know where Guam is located? Okay, near Japan, right? Uh, we are out there. We're the only provider out there, actually. We were been, up until recently, the only provider in Puerto Rico. And my feeling on that was a lot, but that everybody deserved to have the opportunities to have solar and storage, not just folks that lived in the lower 48. And that was, I will tell you, a very, and continues to be hard, hard fought battle on Wall Street with the banks to allow the credit. And there's a lot of misperception of the risk of that credit to this day. And so we went in there because we felt like it was the right thing to do. And we went in there in 2013. Uh, and then, of course, everybody knows what happened with Hurricane Maria about, what, about four or five years later in, in 2017. It was devastating. Uh, it, uh, there was moments in time that I didn't know if all of our employees were, were alive uh, and certainly had no idea whether or anything was left in Puerto Rico. I need the solar panels and such. Batteries were not a thing at that point in time. That's critically important to understand. And so what we did was, first of all, we made sure our employees were safe, made sure our customers were safe, and then we started importing panels. We bought batteries, which at that point in time literally took a ship coming out of Korea, going to Australia, directed it to San Juan. And that took me a grand total of about $1.9 million. Today, we sell more of that in half a day. And some days, it'll be just in a couple of hours to give you an idea. And then we put everything we had into it, money, uh, all of our resources, and we fixed what ultimately ended up being over 7,000 solar systems in Puerto Rico. Minimal damage, I might add. It was still significant, minimal damage. It took us a long time because the entire power system needed to be brought back up, but we did it. It's the largest repair of a solar fleet in the world ever, which sounds dramatic, but that's true. That's what it was. And then you'd ask, well, how did the people get the money to be able to do all those repairs? Nobody in Puerto Rico paid a penny for those repairs, not a penny. We did it. Um, it was what our obligation was to the community. It's what we felt like was the right thing to do. I even worked out a deal with the then sitting governor. It said that from now on, it is policy and will be done that every home will have a battery. And we worked instrumentally with Tesla in particular, now some other, other equipment providers, but primarily Tesla to make sure that that happened. And so now that community, which arguably is, is well, it's not an argument, it is not one of the richest communities 
in the United States has access and is very dependent in many cases on solar flow storage service you know, from Sonova. And they're able to get their energy service at a better price and certainly is a lot better energy service. So I think when you look at true purpose about it, you're creating businesses. And I do believe that market-based companies, capitalism, can be uh, a way of changing society for the good. And it absolutely is the best way to change society for the good. You need to make money, that's true, but don't forget why you're here, why you're doing this, what's the purpose. It's to change the world and make people's lives better. And that's what we did. That's a small example of, of, a, of one firm doing it, my firm, obviously, I can speak to. I'm sure there's, I know there's others out there looking at all the things that Tesla has done uh, that's been good for the world. So there's a lot that's happening here. There's a lot more that needs to happen here to really open the aperture to make sure everybody participates. But it's something that's uh, fundamentally very, very important to, to, to me and to Sonova is how do we make sure that everybody in the world has access to these energy technologies and at the right price that makes their life uh, better? Thank you. Well, does somebody want to go second now? Just a second. Thank you. Uh, thank you for your great presentation. Uh, my question is regarding the ESG benefits. So I was just reading through your ESG report, and it's very impressive. Uh, but I wonder, how do you value, or how do your investors value the ESG benefits that you provide? I see that you're offsetting a lot of carbon. Is there a financial motive to that, even without a carbon tax in the United States? Yes. Um, and you made Kelsey, Ms. Holberg, very happy. She's the author of that report, uh, by the way, so y'all can come up and see her. Um, I, I, I would say this, you know, it's ESG, right? So the environmental side of things, uh, I think it's fairly self-explanatory, self-evident, you know, a solar and storage company with all the other technologies that we have, EV charging and, and uh, load management and so forth, you know, all of that is doing uh, more than our fair share of work, obviously, to improve the environment, decarbonization. Now, part of that, we do get revenues for cert in certain states, and the number of those states uh, has been growing uh, and, and to offset carbon. Some of those are very specific structures, and I won't get into it, it gets complex. Solar renewable energy credits that are very specific to renewable or to solar behind the meter on homes. And some of it's just writ large emission carbon credits, uh, inclusive of the state of Texas, by the way. Uh, we've been able to finally get into something that makes economic sense and monetize some credits there. So we essentially do a lot of what we do with uh, uh, not much of an eye on monetizing those em environmental credits. But we've looked at that, of like, how do we consistently, as the markets develop, as pricing moves upwards, where it makes it worth your while to go out there and, and essentially harvest those, make sure that they're accurate, that it's an honest assessment, and, and then you can go out there and uh, recruit money for, for shareholders. And ultimately what that does is buy down the service for consumers, right? So there's that piece of it. And again, I think it's uh, fairly self-evident about you know, what Sonova is and how we fit in the environmental side. Recycling of, of metals is another area that's coming up very, very quickly that will be a big part of. But uh, I think it's, like I said, I think it's pretty clear on that front. And there is monetization and money, if you will, in, in carbon, despite the lack of the carbon tax or any sort of real national price or global price for carbon. Um, the, the, the social aspect of it is, We've done some community involvement. Uh, I'm not gonna do a spoiler alert or anything else, but you know, spoil things, But because uh, the other side of Kelsey's job is corporate comm, so she'll kill me. But we do have something else that we're gonna be doing that it'll be a part of a, a community that is um, uh, quite underserved. And we're in, in, and again, part of our corporate mission is to go in there and try to do uh, right for, for others that have been left behind. Now. I could go broke and we'll break it to try to solve all the world's problems. Uh, but uh, we certainly can take on as much as we can and go out there and try to make a difference where we can. And, and we do try to do that. And with that, 
Another piece of the social side is diversity. Diversity is very important. I made mention of Houston being the most diverse city in the United States. The other thing that you may not realize is, and I, don't, I can't say this with certainty, okay, but I'm pretty sure that we may be the most diverse renewable energy company in the entire country, certainly one of scale. Um, now, how did that happen? Well, if you grow up in the most diverse city in the United States and you're open-minded and you just want to have people come in, do a great job, go change the world, that just happens. And that's exactly the, the approach that I took. Uh, and uh, that's exactly the culture you find at Sonova. And it's not just ethnicity. It's not just religion. It's any other choices that you may make in life. They're your own choice. Everybody is special. And we firmly believe that at Sonova. So that's the S part of it. The G part of it is really just doing a good job as far as how are you uh, governing the company. Um, and there may be some differences of opinions and, and so forth about how to, how to do the right thing. But ultimately, what we always ask is, and I always ask all of my folks is, is this intellectually honest to do? If we create a metric, a non-GAAP metric or something, is this really state what the truth is, what the cash position of the company is, what we're doing uh, for, for a company, how are we running the company? What are the right rules to do that? How do we make sure that there's inclusiveness with, across the company? And that really gets into the governance side of things. And candidly, you know, uh, I started my career, it's probably it, out there, it's probably, you can see it, you probably looked it up. I started my career at Enron. Probably needed to work a little bit on the G side, on the ESG side there, right? And that wouldn't have, that wouldn't have happened. So some of those things, like everything else in life, uh, some you'll, you, you uh, learn the easy way. That's the right way to do it, as I tell my kids. And then some you'll just learn the hard way or it's thrust upon you, which is the case. Uh, but you learn that lesson. And part of that is uh, just making sure that you don't complicate your financial statements any more than you have to, that you try to express uh, and do everything for shareholders that's the right thing to do, not just try to dress up financial statements to do that, to try to get a higher valuation or on your stock or something like that. So I think a lot of the ethics is pulled through all of this, all the S, all the S, uh, all the E, all the S, all the G. And so that's really something that's really, you can call it tone from the top and so forth, but it's my responsibility. And uh, it's something I take very seriously to make sure that we're doing everything we can. And we are not perfect. Let me be very clear about that. There is a lot of stuff that we need to do, and it's all my fault <laughs> that we need to do to fix. Um, but you know, if we were perfect, my personal belief, I wouldn't be here on this earth. And, and so there's plenty of things I'm gonna have to work on. And my wife has a whole list of things I need to work on, yeah, trust me. So we're never gonna be done with this. We're not perfect, but we're always striving to do uh, a better and better job at, at all three of those letters. Anybody want to go a third? I've got a question. So there's so many uh, big challenges that you've obviously done a good job at overcoming. Maybe you could talk some of them. So when I hear about firms like yours, uh, customer acquisition, dealing with balance of system costs, the technology trends, integrating all these different pieces from vendors, could you kind of touch on each one of those and what your lessons have learned and what you see as far as trends are for each one of those important factors, as well as any others that you think are even more important? Yeah, there, there, there's a lot there. <laughs> um, what I would say it, on customer acquisition side, the, the cost of this has been a problem for the residential solar industry. Um, I think a lot of that is gonna be solved over a period of time, you know, a, as more and more people become, and, and you see this in California, and you're starting to see it pop up here in, uh, in Houston and Austin, which is, of course I get a solar system and of course I get a battery. Like I'm just figuring out who do I wanna to go to to get the service and get this done. Well, there's nothing cheaper than somebody calling you up and going, uh, I'm, gonna, I'm sold, I'm doing this. I'm just trying to figure out which one of you I'm gonna do it with. And you're like, okay, great. Instead of spending so much money to go to their homes, go out there, do Google AdWords, all this stuff, pass, even passive marketing in some markets and try to bring those customers in. That's very, very expensive, right? So I think naturally, as an S-curve, it takes care of itself. Uh, I think an a, a important piece of the consumer interface is, was the consumer told the truth? My wife found an ad just yesterday, showed it to me, 
and it had in there that said that the, you know, sign up, the government is giving you a free solar system and battery. And in fact, the government's going to give you a $2,500 check too. So you're going to get everything free and the government's going to give you $2,500. What's the catch? It's a lie. It's a lie. And yet that's out there. I think the FTC probably needs to be doing a little bit more cop on the beat work. Um, and we see that if we find that within the sales force of our dealers, that person is out. There is no uh, second chance. And that's it. If we find that to be a systemic issue, which we run into every once in a while in a blue moon with that dealer, we're done. After the, sec after the second time where it's, oh, it's just one bad apple, if it ends up being a second, you're done. So I think a large part of getting back into doing what's right for society is doing what's right for the customer, explaining exactly what the customer is going to get and what they're not going to get up front. The other thing, and I really feel very passionately about this, uh, is my industry outside of Sonova and outside of a couple of other firms need to think long term and do what's right for the customer. Go fix the system. Stop telling Mrs. Smith that there's no moving parts, nothing's going to happen. Something's going to happen. The fuses are going to blow. Squirrel's going to chew on this and that. It will go down. Who's taking care of that? Or did you take all your money and run? Are you there to take care of the problem? For instance, the Maria issue uh, and, and uh, uh, problem that we uh, overcame in, in uh, Puerto Rico. If we just took our money and ran away from the island, who's fixing those systems? Nobody. Was that due to the people of Puerto Rico? It, it, it gyps them. I mean, they're, they're out of a lot of money. This stuff doesn't work. It's a pile of stuff on the roof. That's not right. So you want to think about, are you doing this for the long term? And then a lot of other decisions that you want to do with customers, the right ones fall out of that uh, thought process and view. Uh, moving into technology side of things, uh, what I would say is uh, there's a lot of technologies coming out. Uh, there are product iterations. One of the big problems that we face in the supply chain, uh, just given the influx, uh, in, uh, inflection of demand, rather, uh, on the global energy business, yes, caused by $100 plus crude. Now it appears $8 natty, uh, natural gas, sorry, use a slang term. Uh, and power rates moving up 20, 30, 40, 50 plus percent. Those are real numbers. Uh, when you look at that, you'd say, uh, well, we need all the gear we can, and that's true. But then the companies that you expect, the Teslas of the world, the Generax, the Enphase, the Solar Edge, et cetera, they've got a lot of money, and they're pumping out different products all the time, which is wonderful for the market. But you've got to keep up with the obsolescence and make sure that your inventory levels don't get, uh, inventory doesn't get too old. So that's, that's a challenge by itself, keeping up with the innovation. Integrating all these different pieces of hardware, we were talking about that earlier, Putting all that in. So you got a Generac generator, you got a Tesla Powerwall, you got a Hanwha panel, and you got an in phase inverter, and maybe you got something from Solar Edge on the load management side or something. Like somebody's got to make all that stuff work and it work for 25 plus years. That's us. So we spend an awful lot of money on the software development, making sure we can pull all the data in for all those disparate pieces of equipment, then put it in a useful format allow to have a single interface, an app with our customers that they can come in and make complaints or make requests or pay bills, whatever it is that they want to do. And then we have, like I said, going back into service, a fleet of men and women that roll around in trucks every single day of, every, uh, of the year, fixing the problems and making sure that all these different pieces work together and talk together. So then the last one is, you know, what are the new boxes in the future that we're not dealing with right now? I think load management is going to be a big part of this. Uh, there's all different ways that this could go about. Uh, we were talking earlier, uh, they, you know, do we get more, do we get involved in air conditioning because it's a big load? I don't know. Um, how do you think about vehicles where they could be not only the, uh, a draw of power, but a supplier of power? And how does that work with the auto OEMs and so forth? Um, the software that's going to be take, you know, take, uh, to, uh, charge them. And then how do you think about, you know, when they go away from the house, like my car, my Tesla is, is here looking for a charger, by the way. <laughs> so just my, my recommendation, University of Texas, is go out and get a lot of EV chargers. I thought the campus would be full of them. Turns out there's not really, I think, but one on the entire campus. So there's an opportunity for somebody. Um, so 
you, you got to pull all these different pieces together, and then there's other technologies that are coming. The fuel cells, is that going to be something that, that uh, is real viable in certain markets? I don't know, but we're certainly giving it a shot. Is there going to be something like a, a real strong uh, uh, you know, and, and very complex and very intelligent uh, a J box? So you know, I don't know. I mean, you can make an argument that should be just really simple. You can make an argument that could be really cool and do a lot of things, right? So we're looking at both of those. There's a lot of different things that are coming, uh, and the in the gear that's already here, if you will, is already innovating at a pretty rapid clip, and that and that uh, pace of innovation is increasing exponentially. So it's all good and exciting, but it's definitely a lot to take in and really be able to manage. But that's you know it's an all-encompassing answer to an all-encompassing question, but all the way through, hopefully that gives you a, a, a sense of what we see in the industry. Further questions? So I have one, if not. Um, so so you're, you, you very aptly characterize Sedova as a wireless power company, right? That, that's a very intriguing concept. How do you think the wireless power concept can expand to areas in, in the country and around the world that are not blessed with solar exposure? So I came here via Minnesota in New York, and mm -hmm. I was shocked that the sun can actually shine year-round. Um, <laughs> there it doesn't. Yeah. What do you do? Actually, uh, our third biggest market is New Jersey. Um, I think our, either it's our fifth or sixth biggest market is New York. Uh, I think our fourth biggest is Massachusetts. Um, it's either that or Connecticut, one or the other. So one's four, one's five. So. Uh, we have a dominant position in the Northeast United States, um, and you know there is not enough as we as much sunlight as we'd like as compared to maybe Florida, Texas, but there's enough to make it really worthwhile. Uh, there's also differing rates of power, costs of natural gas, for instance. The Northeast is because of the LNG cargoes going to Germany now is two x or more higher in natural gas costs than, say, what you, you would pay down here in Texas. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot more variable inputs that go to a, into a, making something make sense for the consumer than just sunlight. Uh, and I do think that the seasonal load shift, so this means essentially that the power generated in the summer is a lot more than the power generated in the winter, especially in the Northeast, right? You just go up the latitudes, the days get longer, shorter, than, than here, uh, depending on the time of the year. And when you look at that, I think that that presents, in terms of the seasonal load shift, an enormous challenge and, and mandates a usage of technology uh, more so than, say, Texas or Florida, like storage or fuel cells. And frankly, that was one of the areas what we really thought would be interesting on fuel cells, which is how do you have a, a technology that's clean, that can produce the hydrogen, where you know during the day, even uh, the short hours, and then be able to use that uh, during the time where it's cold and dark. Uh, and I think that increasingly we'll size systems to essentially the winter time period up there, and we'll essentially have excess power in the summer uh, as the energy density of solar modules gets better and better. And we can start to see a shift in that already uh, with consumers doing just that. So I think technology uh, through its advancement, its improvement, uh, and its cost improvement, will certainly solve uh, that those issues. And, and right now, some of the other variables outweigh the the sunlight. Uh, you, know, in, you know, in terms of the you know, relative little uh, amount of sunlight that's produced up there, relative to say a Florida or a Texas. Any last questions? Yes, we have we have time for maybe a couple more. Who's thinking about going into the, the energy transition energy business or the renewable energy business, wherever you want to phrase it as? Okay, the rest of you ought to think about it hard. It's going to be, uh, it's a, uh, I think it's an enormous opportunity. Uh, and uh, it's, some, it's a place where I think that you're going to get a lot of fulfillment, not just uh, if, if you want to go out there and make a lot of money, you're going to be able to have that opportunity. Uh, I firmly believe that. I think the energy business is going to be the place to be for the next few years, 
it was in the first part of my career, and then uh, the middle part, maybe not as much, kind of a drought period, if you will. But here, clearly, you see what's going on relative to other parts of the economy, very, very exciting. Uh, and then, uh, I think, uh, most importantly, you, real, you bring real purpose to your life by coming into the energy business and doing the right areas, solving the right problems, solving the problems for people that um, you know, don't have the wherewithal uh, financially or the resources or the knowledge to really go out there and improve their lives with clean and affordable uh, energy, you can go out there and you can make a difference in their lives. And, in, and I really truly believe that at least here at Sonova, we're here to change the world. Uh, we're gonna keep focused on making sure that we do the blocking and tackling. We're not gonna get too uh, in love with the vision that we lose sight on what we need to do on a day-to-day -day basis for our customers and our shareholders and our other stakeholders. But uh, it'll be a very, very fulfilling uh, career. When I look at my four kids, I know that I'm doing something and I feel very good about that each and every day uh, to make their lives better. And so I greatly encourage you, whether it's Sonova or anybody else in the energy business, uh, to take a look, a serious look at making a, a career of it. I think, uh, I think you won't be uh, disappointed. Let, let me ask you one last question. As the CEO of, of an energy company, what is the technology that, that you dream of? Let's say something doesn't exist today, but you think would make kind of a killer app in, in the future if it became available. So to answer that in two ways, if you can get, um, I think I know you know this, but everybody knows solid state lithium, that technology, okay. If, some, if that works or something like it, and there's a lot working on QuantumScape and a bunch of others that are pretty well funded that think they can make it work in, in not the too distant future. Uh, if you can get a storage technology to last that long, cost that little, has that kind of energy density, I would say, I'm gonna use this, I don't think there's too many reporters out there, right? Uh, that's game over. If that can happen, that will make the dominance of solar and storage um, uh, happen, I mean, in a very relatively quick fashion. And I do think something like that's coming because there's so much money is being pumped in, into this and the demand is there. And frankly, the other technologies are not immensely far off when you look at technology development over measured over five, 10, 15, 20, 20 some odd years. So I think that's the game changer that I look at near, uh, in the relatively intermediate term, if you will, that I think could make a difference in, in basically like I said, make it game over. The one that everybody knows, including it like Star Trek and so forth is um, fusion, right? I mean, Bill Gates is working on some things there. I've had some other friends that are involved in that. If that happens, Houston better get another industry really fast. But, but uh, elsewhere, me too, uh, as well as, you know, frankly, Tesla uh, outside the car. So when you look at that, you know, when you look at fusion, uh, it may always be, 20 years later, right? 20 years from now, it's always on the horizon. But if that were to happen, uh, that would mean uh, you know, very, you know, very inexpensive, clean energy that's basically limitless. That would be the, I think, the, the complete game changer for, for mankind on the energy front. Well, you are indirectly taking advantage of that, right? It, it, that's, it, 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 <laughs> that, it, it is happening I, somewhere. I, 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 that is true, that is true. Yes, that's right, that's right. You're right about that. The, for sure, for sure. So, all right. All right. I think we're at the end of the, the hour. Um, thank you so much for all right. taking the time to visit. Thanks for having me. And, uh, and, uh, and self-promotion, we are hiring across the board, no matter what position it is. So if you, if you liked anything you heard or you know some folks, some of you are already working with uh, Sonova. Uh, we have internship programs. We have, uh, like I said, jobs openings really across the board almost in every department and division. So uh, please, uh, you know, look us up, give us a call, give us a shot, and uh, maybe there's a meeting in the minds. We'd love to have you as part of the team. So thanks for the consideration.